The methods and procedures for electromyographic sampling of intrinsic laryngeal muscles in awake humans was first performed effectively by Dr. Fahlberg Anderson in Denmark in the mid-1950s. The development of the hooked wire electrode by Baz Magian offered the possibility of a more valid and reliable sampling from the sensitive region of the larynx with the subject performing in a more normal state. The Speech Research Laboratory at the VA Medical Center in San Francisco began using intramuscular hooked wire electrodes in the intrinsic laryngeal muscles in 1966. Since then, 75 subjects have undergone this procedure. This technique is complex and to be done successfully requires a melding of specialized equipment, drug administration, control procedures, and a great deal of experience. The danger to the subject when the procedure is done carefully is quite minimal. This visual presentation is an attempt to demonstrate what we have learned over the years so that others may be encouraged to pursue such physiologic studies, exercising the appropriate controls so that valid data are acquired and the findings are replicable. Topical anesthetization throughout the vocal tract is done by the laryngologist using a variety of application techniques. It takes approximately 15 minutes to spray, drip, or directly apply the anesthetic agent to the mucous membranes from the oral pharynx to the tracheal bifurcation. To prepare the subject for the rather complex procedure, Injections are given of 100 milligrams of Demerol for pain control, 200 milligrams of the tranquilizer Atarax, and 0.05 milligrams of atropine, a drying agent to counteract the excess mucus flow stimulated by the topical anesthetic application. Once the physician is satisfied with the level of topical anesthesia, an electrode receptacle box is placed on the subject to receive the proximal ends of the electrode wires. A grounding plate is attached to his shoulder, and he's placed in a supine position for desensitization of the neck area through which the electrodes will be inserted to the laryngeal muscles. This next section is the most critical one, since no matter how carefully we screen the subjects, Occasionally, it is impossible for the subject to tolerate the insertion of the laryngoscope so that the full vocal fold length can be observed directly. First, a lead tooth guard is inserted to protect the subject's maxillary teeth. And the laryngoscope is then inserted to the pharynx, then into the larynx. Down 
a laryngoscope holder is attached and is cranked into position so that the laryngologist is free to use both hands for the subsequent electrode placement. From post-procedural interviews, subjects report they're able to relax their mandible and neck muscles to tolerate being suspended from the laryngoscope while still maintaining the ability to respond to questions and to carry out instructions. With a subject in this position, the laryngologist observes the tip of the electrode-bearing needle when it enters the airway so he can direct the insertion to the target muscle. This next view is what the laryngologist sees through the laryngoscope. Keith, Keith, that's it. That's right. Okay. Again, please. All right. One more time. Okay, now can you back off, uh, uh, Tom, and pull back so we can see what we're, the total thing we're looking at? And undrape him. Sure. Okay. Now, Paul, would you shave for that? The very fine wires used as electrodes are carried to the muscles by number 25 hypodermic needles varying in length from 5 eighths of an inch to 2 inches. Seen here is the insertion of the needle through the cricothyroid membrane into the subglottal airway where it is directed to the thyroarytenoid muscle. Electrode placement in the thyroarytenoid and the interarytenoid muscles is through the cricothyroid membrane. The needle is withdrawn, leaving the electrode wires hooked to the appropriate muscle fibers. The needle is removed from the electrode and the wire ends are attached to the electrode box. To reach the belly of the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, the hub of the electrode-bearing needle is grasped by long handle forceps and the needle introduced down through the laryngoscope where the needle tip is directed through the anterior pharyngeal wall into the posterior portion of the cricoid cartilage. The accuracy of electrode placement is checked by listening to the acoustic representation of the muscle signal over a speaker as well as by visually monitoring an oscilloscope. Here, the top channel is the posterior cricoarytenoid, the second channel is from the interarytenoid, and the third channel is from the thyroarytenoid muscle. Thank you. All right, would you do that again one more time, please? After verification of electrode placement accuracy, the laryngoscope is removed from the subject. A custom-made dental appliance that fits over the mandibular molars is constructed for each patient so that the electrode wires from the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle will be routed from the oropharynx along a pathway between the teeth and cheek to prevent the subject's accidental biting through the electrode wires because of this anesthetized oropharyngeal region. Electrode placement to the cricothyroid muscle is accomplished by palpating the exterior neck and inserting the needle along the lower border of the cricoid cartilage. The object on the right is a muscle stimulator. We have several tests that must be passed before we consider the placement as being accurate in the cricothyroid muscle. The first is that muscle activity should increase as the subject increases his vocal pitch. Okay, relax for a moment. Now just go. The second test is that vocal pitch elevate when the muscle stimulator is turned on. In 
this case, the downward motion of the larynx and the termination of phonation with muscle stimulation suggests that the electrode was located either in the sternothyroid or sternohyoid muscle. A second, a second electrode placement was conducted with the following results. Pitch and just sweep it on up to the highest. Subglottal air pressure is sampled through an intratracheal catheter. First, a needle is inserted between the first and second tracheal rings to the lumen of the trachea. Next, a small catheter is threaded through the needle approximately five inches down the trachea. The needle is then withdrawn, leaving the catheter in place. catheter is then attached to a pressure transducer taped to the subject's shoulder. The catheter is considered clear when the subject's syllable repetition creates both a DC shift with an AC ripple on the oscilloscopic trace. Since the magnitude of the EMG signal is dependent upon the distance between the bipolar electrodes, the amount of electrode tip exposure, and the electrode's location within the muscle, it is impossible to compare obtained muscle contraction magnitudes across subjects, or for that matter, even from the same subject for two different electrode insertions. To overcome this problem, we have devised a method of physiological calibration. For a given electrode insertion, each subject performs a maneuver specifically designed to sample each muscle's EMG activity across its full range. The peak activity for each muscle during this maneuver is integrated and averaged and assigned a value of 100. The baseline noise level for each muscle when quiet is also integrated and averaged and assigned a value of zero. In this manner, any muscle activity during the experimental procedure can be expressed as a percentage of that muscle's contraction for the given electrode insertion. These percentages then can be compared within and between subjects so that statements can be made about populations larger than one. Sampling laryngeal muscle activity during different voice, speech, and vegetative maneuvers 
provides important information on the patterning of muscle behavior to accomplish different events and the strategy used by normal and pathologic subjects in carrying out the activity. To obtain these data is difficult, but the results provide important information on how the larynx performs its many complicated tasks.